you ever watch a sporting event like the Olympics and you fantasize about being there and wonder what it would take for you to be there? Let's back that up a step. What would it take if you were, I don't know, uh, quadriplegic? Well, that seems like an unbelievable path from here to there. Well, let's find out how we can make that believable. On today's episode of The Movement Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body starting feet first, because you know those things are your foundation. Uh, and we break down the propaganda, the mythology, sometimes the outright lies you've been told about what it takes to run or walk or hike or play or do yoga or CrossFit or be an Olympian, all those other things. Um, and you know to do them enjoyably and efficiently and effectively. Wait, did I say enjoyably? I know I did. That's a trick question. Because look, if you're not having fun, you're not going to want to keep it up anyway. So find something you enjoy, bottom line. I'm Stephen Sashin from ZeroShoes.com. And I'm your host of the Movement Movement. We call it that because we are creating a movement about natural movement, letting your body do what it's made to do. And the movement part involves all of us. It's really, really simple. The first step, go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. There's nothing you need to do to join. That's just the place where you can find previous episodes. You can opt in to hear about new episodes. You'll find the places that you can find all of our episodes. You'll find where we are on social media. And of course, the request is simple. Give us a thumbs up, give us a review, like, give us a five-star rating, hit the bell icon on YouTube. You know the drill. If you want to be part of the tribe, just please subscribe. So uh, let us get started. Stephen, do me a favor. Tell people who you are and what you're doing here. Yeah. My name is Steven Munitonis, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called KatsuGlobal.com. And um, what we do is we actually sell rather simple but profound equipment and teach people exactly what you are advocating, how to move. Now, when most people think about movement, we think about moving our feet, obviously, moving our arms, our trunk, etc. We view movement as internal movement. We view movement as internal to our body. So at every moment in, in, in our lives, every moment, there are hundreds of millions or perhaps billions of interactions in our, in our brains, in our core, in our legs, et cetera. Blood is flowing, metabolites are being produced, uh, hormones are flowing, and that is what Katsu tries to emphasize and enhance. So in a word is Katsu, means additional pressure. Some of your uh, runners and other people who move may have heard of the word shiatsu. She is a Japanese word. It, she means hand. Atsu means pressure. Kaatsu means additional pressure. So what we do is we put these bands on our arms or our legs, and that applies additional pressure. That's all the equipment does. And then we let the body take over. We're headquartered in Southern California, and uh, we, we're we in 49 countries now um, with our equipment and helping people from quadriplegics to Olympic medalists. There we go. So I was doing the path from quadriplegic to Olympic, which is one thing, but we're just talking about a range from quadriplegics to Olympics. So so let's talk a couple things. Um, I don't know which one I want to do first because I've got a bunch. Um, let's do this simple one for people who are hip to what you showed. Um, and if you, and for anyone listening or watching, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we will, I'll explain it, but let me just do the, the question with jargon first. How are the devices that you have different than any other form of blood flow restriction products? Yeah, it's uh, actually quite simple. Our bands are narrow and actually when they're inflated, I don't have it on right now. When it's inflated, this inner bladder is at an oval shape. What that means is with every heartbeat, blood goes naturally into your, your limbs, your arms or your legs without impeding. There is no blood flow restriction. The blood naturally flows out. Becoming back, it is slowed down every 30 seconds. What happens is the band is inflated, then it's compressed. And it's like creating a small dam, very small dam. And the venous flow, so the flow of blood from your hands or your feet back to your trunk is slightly slowed down. And that means you have an abundance of blood in your hands or arms, feet, or legs. And that replicates exercise. That replicates movement. That creates a variety of biochemical reactions in the body oh. that are healing. 
Interesting. So I'm going to be mildly obnoxious when I say it this way. So fundamentally, what you just described is what the so blood flow restriction for people who don't know is similar to what Stephen just just mentioned. The idea being that if you're if you are imagine just putting a tourniquet around your upper arm, um, but not so tight that it cuts off the blood flow in both directions, tight enough that it is letting blood flow into your arm, but is restricting the return, the venous flow coming back. And if you do that while you're doing, say, biceps curls or tricep extensions, um, it, it, it seems to create a hormonal response First of all, you can you, you can only use much lighter weights. Um, the burn is really intense. It's, if you're an exercise masochist, it's the greatest. Um, if you don't like you know the pain that when you can't lift a weight that's like one pound, no matter how hard you try, maybe not your thing. But very interesting. But you, what you're talking about is two things that are different than most of the blood flow restriction products that I know of. One is the inflatable part, and I want you to talk about that. And the other is. Um, if I'm hearing what you said correctly, you're not focused on using these while you're exercising. You've got a different idea of what to do with these and what the effect or benefit is. Did I get that right? Correct. I'll address your second issue first. And that is whether you're someone who is disabled or you've had a hip surgery, you've uh, tripped as you were doing trail running, or you're an Olympic athlete who just finished a semifinal and is preparing for the final. In all of these cases, Katsu is best used while sitting down or lying down. Now, let's say you are someone who is not motivated to exercise. Let's say you leave a very sedentary life, or let's say you're active, but you're at your desk for 12 hours a day. In all of these cases, we advocate and people use, whether you're that Olympic athlete preparing for the Olympic final or that person who doesn't like to do much and they would (laughs) rather just sit at their desk and eat Cheetos or, you know, Doritos and drink a Coke, or you're a person who is active and you just had a, a, some kind of injury. In all of these cases, you are sedentary. Right. And we're talking about the movement movement. That is exactly what our bodies do at every moment in time, every moment in time. We are just utilizing the body's natural system, natural mechanisms, modifying it slightly for 30 seconds releasing, pressure, release, pressure, release. And that is enough to elicit all kinds of biochemical reactions in the body. So what kind of things in terms of those biochemical reactions, what are you seeing? How much research is behind that? Um, You know, more specifically, first of all, that's the other distinction with what you're doing other than using it while you're not moving um, is that on off thing. And I imagine between the, let's say the pumping phenomenon that you're dealing with when you're impeding blood flow to a certain extent, right. and then then how that sort of releases, I can imagine, since I haven't used this device, how that can have a slightly you know euphoric induce or euphoria inducing effect. I'm just having a flashback quite comically to when I had some wrist surgery and they put a tourniquet on my arm, filled me full of whatever the anesthetic was, couldn't feel a thing. I was watching the whole thing, which is really fun. But when they removed the tourniquet, all of that uh, anesthetic just and and just all the blood just flowed into my brain, and I literally just shouted like you know a rebel yell kind of thing in the in the ER because I got instantly so high so fast, and it also just felt really good having all that blood coming back in and starting to move again. But anyway, that's yeah. the perceptual thing. But I'm also curious about the researchy sciencey part. Yeah. So again, I'll, I'll address the, the latter first. So that I'll try, I'll try and figure out how to ask these things in reverse next time. <laughs> no, well, it's easier to go from the, the sort of layman's perspective, and then we'll get to the scientific perspective. Okay. So the reason why you felt that euphoria is exactly why we do the pressure on pressure off every 30 seconds. It's not that massive dope, uh, that massive, um, increase in dopamine and uh, adrenaline and euphoria that you felt, it just slightly tiny drops that were going along the way. Just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And we always want to end up a katsu session with what we call the katsu smile. Now, (laughs) people aren't yelling like a rebel, but they are making a smile. And when you can make that Olympian a disabled person, that person who leads a sedentary life to have a smile at the end of our session, we know that we have been successful. Now, how did we come to creating the equipment that looks like this? 
the protocols that we do. And that actually goes way back to Dr. Sato, the, the founder of Katsu. And I, I won't go into the details, but for 20 years, he was in his laboratory, in himself, doing all kinds of self-experimentation. And he came up with, initially, his goal was simply to get more muscle. That was his goal. He was a, he was a power lifter in his youth. That was his that was his chosen sport. So he was actually actively, you know, doing all kinds of exercises in order to be successful in his chosen sport that was powerlifting. After he retired from the powerlifting uh, portion of his life, the competition part, then he was into bodybuilding. So his initial purpose for doing katsu or finding out the mechanism of katsu is simply to build bigger biceps and triceps and traps and deltoids, et cetera. But along the way, he started to see different effects. His stamina increased, his, he was sleeping better, and he would just intellectually curious, why were these things happening? So uh, around 1994, so we're talking 30 years ago, 1994 or so, he teamed up with a bunch of researchers at the University of Tokyo, and they were exercise physiologists, and they did a variety of testing, and they were astounded that people, whether they were sitting down and doing Dr. Sato's protocols or actively doing bicep curls or push-ups, they were seeing unheard of results at the time. And as scientists being scientists, they wanted to ask, why was that? Dr. Sato at the time was simply taking his personal self um, experimentation with, you know, the people in his neighborhood, and he replicated those um, movements, those protocols, those equipment in the laboratory with the scientists. And in the year 2000, they came out with the seminal paper uh, in the Journal of Applied Physiology on BFR, on Katsu. Reason why BFR was the acronym that was chosen in Dr. Sato and uh, Dr. Ishii's paper that they submitted to the Journal of Applied Physiology, they actually used the word katsu, a Japanese word. It's, it's an actual Japanese word. And you know, the, the editors of the journal said, you know, we can't use foreign yeah. words. Yeah. Nobody knows what katsu is. So they came up with a term that initially vascular occlusion. And again, we're taking non-native speakers of English, trying to submit a, 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 a scientific paper to a journal to native speakers of English. And there was some, something was lost in the translation. And the doctors at, at the University of Tokyo knew that they were modifying the blood flow back, but the implications were that they were occluding the blood flow out. So right from the initial paper, there was a disconnect. Now, that was a great paper. It identified human growth hormone, uh, uh, IGF-1, insulin growth factor, adrenaline, and a variety of other uh, reactions that the body naturally does through katsu. And then from the year 2000, uh, more and more papers were being developed. And the real key where we know all of this stuff or all the stuff that we know to date about Katsu was between 2004 and 2014. And because by 2004, Dr. Sato, uh, Professor Ishii, et cetera, they understood that this mechanism of Katsu was actually due to the vascular tissue within the body that was expanding and contracting. That was the catalyst for muscle growth, secretion of growth hormone, secretion of IGF-1, uh, nitric oxide, BDNF, et cetera. That was the catalyst. And so from 2001 to 2014, a 10-year period, they tested over 12,000 patients, including 2,000 people who were cardiac, uh, who had a cardiac event, so they had a heart attack, a stroke, et cetera, on Katsu. And this team was entirely comprised of cardiologists mm. because they were most excited about the ability to increase the elasticity of our vascular tissue. That is the core and that is the, the patent, that is the whole purpose of the equipment to make the vascular tissue more elastic. So well, after that 10 year period, then we started Katsu Global. 
Got it. Okay. So I got now I, I'm, I'm not going to do things in reverse because I can't remember what order I'm thinking these things in, but I'm going to start actually at the beginning for people who think this sounds a little crazy. Um, I'm going to put it in a weird context when I'm going to use bicep curls as an example, when you're doing a bicep curl and you get that pump that you're feeling, it's actually doing some vascular occlusion, basically because the muscle cells are swelling, they are applying pressure into to, into the, the circulatory system and creating a similar effect. This is just either augmenting that or supplementing that or replacing that, uh, depending on how you're using it. That's sort of part one. Part two um, is that when that happens, just again, if you're just regularly lifting weights, it is creating these various responses, partly because your body is going, oh, crap, um, we got to do something about this, um, but in a controlled way. And the uh, this is something I'm actually curious about. The vascular flexibility is very interesting. Um, I was actually I, I I used to really enjoy volunteering for scientific studies and getting paid you know some money to do crazy shit. Um, and and here at the University of Colorado, the department that's doing studies on aging. Almost every study they're doing has to do with uh, vascular flexibility, both arterial and venous. And because this is something that typically gets worse over time, pardon the thunder behind us, gets worse over time, and they're looking for ways to help uh, prevent that. And there's some that are very interesting, like using a particular kind of sugar molecule called trellos that seems to help with vascular flexibility. Um, but my question becomes... How, how were, if, if you know, how are they checking this or measuring this, especially if you're only applying the pressure in a couple of very specific places rather than something? I mean, let me ask the question differently. Are they seeing and have, is there something showing a systemic effect from doing the, the compression in specific locations? Yes. So the, the answer is yes. And I'll explain the mechanism why. So increasing the vascular elasticity is goal number one. Goal number two is eliciting that hormonal response. So there are two goals that the cardiologist and Dr. Sato were looking at. Number one, the increasing the vascular elasticity, that makes sense locally. Right. So I put the band on, you, you engorge the limb and blood, there's more blood. So with every heartbeat, you've got this increase. That's step number one. Step number two is when you do movement and it could be minor movement. Mm -hmm. It could be texting. It could be turning the pages of a book, very minor movement that actually leads to a, a buildup of lactate. Now, if we're doing push-ups, if we're doing burpees, if we're running uphill, obviously the lactate levels increase greatly. If again, you're dealing with someone who's disabled, you just had a hip replacement, a knee replacement, or you just leave a sedentary lifestyle, just do minor movement, handwriting, texting, typing on a computer. As long as you do some movement, lactate levels will increase from, you know, that sort of the average standard adult of two millimoles uh, of lactate to something higher. That elicits the hormonal response. And the best and most effective way of generating that movement is by the upper arm and by the upper leg. Yeah, no, I didn't. It didn't hit me um, as I was as I was thinking about this and then asking the question that yeah, you're doing the compression in your upper arm or your upper leg, but clearly when you're restricting the return blood flow, that is putting more. That is making the blood vessels have to expand, and yes. so so you you are it's it's a passive stretching thing in a way. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Very Absolutely. interesting. When I explain it uh, to people, whether a, a physician or someone who's obviously as knowledgeable as you are of the human physiology, it all starts to make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if I just put this band on and I show up in the gym, people are saying, and I'm not, I'm not going through this explanation. They're like, "What is this weirdo doing? Like, right. this makes no sense whatsoever." If I'm lifting a two pound dumbbell and I'm sweating and, and, and my muscle, my little muscles are bulging a little bit. They're like, it doesn't make any sense. But when we explain what the mechanism of, of the body and where, for example, you have a cast on your arm. So you now you have your cast on your arm. All you need to do is a little bit of movement and you've eliminated the muscle atrophy. Interesting. So, well, that's an intriguing thing for eliminating atrophy during 
without any movement. Um, are you so given? I'm just going to be asking questions about yeah. certain effects. Um, boy, where to go on this one? So one of the other things that affects people as we get older is sarcopenia. So we start losing muscle mass. Right. So is there anything that this is doing? Um, uh, let's say above and beyond lifting weights that may impact that. So our oldest user worldwide is a woman 104 years old. We demonstrated very clearly through imagery of her thigh that we increased her thigh, or her quadricep and her um, hamstring by 22% doing katsu. Our oldest user in the United States is a 95-year-old woman on the island of Kauai. Now, these are 104-year-old, 95. My own father is 88. My mother is 86. These are not the people you're going to see in Goals Gym or 24-Hour Fitness. <laughs> they are the people, though, that want to, to, in, to maintain their quality of life. They want yeah. to be able to go to the supermarket. They want to be able to lift up a gallon of milk. They want to be, be able to walk up and down the stairs. And so for those people, they're not going to lift weights. But as long as they do some what we call micro movements, they are eliciting or they're generating that lactate. Right. That the, 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 the uh, signal is sent up through the central nervous system to their brain. And that it is enough that is sufficient to serve as a catalyst for a secretion of growth hormone. And so you and I would be killing it with bicep curls. My father at 88 the 95-year-old from Hawaii, the 104-year-old from, from Tokyo, they're not about to grab some weights, but they're going to be wiping their countertop right. after a meal. They are going to be brushing their hair. They are going to be brushing their teeth. So they can do put the bands on while they do this movement. Even holding a book is a form of isometric, it's an isometric hold. You're holding the book, turning the page, holding the book, turning the page, as the bands are on, they, whether they're 88 or 104, they're feeling a pump. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's interesting to me is that, you know, there's um, sort of dueling theories in the, quote, anti-aging world. And I say, quote, anti-aging world, because so much of this is completely hypothetical. You know, it's like if we haven't taken two 50-year-olds uh, who are identical twins, put one on whatever the protocol for anti-aging is, and the other doesn't get it. And the first one lives to 120, the other dies at 65, not because it gets hit by a bus, um, you know, then uh, we don't really know some of these things. But um, we do know that increased uh, growth hormone, increased IGF-1, increased anabolic uh, hormones like testosterone, for example, can be problematic when people get older. If you're just increasing them, um, uh, increasing the baseline, for example, if you just got higher IGF-1 levels, let's use that, and that's insulin growth factor one. Um, but what we're talking about here in this conversation is sort of a mm, temporary increase in those things rather than a sort of baseline increase. And I imagine that that's better for aging in the same way that um, there's a lot of research going on about rapamycin, which reduces the effect of certain um, anabolic activities in the body, which seems to improve longevity, but it also reduces your ability to grow muscle mass. So what people are doing now is like cycling that on and off, you know, a couple day on, a couple days off, et cetera. This feels like a similar kind of thing where you're just getting, you know, you're cycling on and off this increase in, in HGH and IGF-1, for example. Yes. I, uh, you know, when I first were was spent those 10 years uh, with the researchers at the University of Tokyo Hospital, the cardiologists and with Dr. Sato since early 2000, they're very gentle people. They look at things, they look at the vascular, uh, the vascular tissue, they look at secretion of hormones in a very, very long term, gentle manner. And this is why when you use the katsu bands, the pressure that you start with is very, very low, very, very gentle. And many of the Americans, when we put it on, whether it's a Navy SEAL or just an active 45-year-old, they put on the band and they go, the first thing they say, for, I would say 25% of the people say, I don't feel anything. And I say, good. We don't want you to... I don't want you to feel the pain or the discomfort that you might have been expecting by some guy, because you've seen on YouTube, some guy lifting heavy weights. 
we want your vascular tissue, you want your whole system to start off at a very, very gentle pressure and just gradually increase for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, take it off. The next day you do it again. So that regularity of our bodies, all of our systems are on a, on a, on a cyclical, cyclical mantle anyway. Right. And the Japanese knew enough that if we added it gently in a regular manner, then over time, that would lead to a very healthful lifespan as opposed to, okay, we're going to do this for a week. You're not going to use it anymore. And suddenly you're healthy. They, again, I think this kind of approach needed that Japanese sort of very long term, gentle approach, you know, whether we all know going in sushi bar, you know, you got to wash the rice and you got to learn how to wash that rice for years and years and years before you get to cut one slice of fish. Right. Yeah, that's so. I again, I got a handful of thoughts. So, talk to me. Um, I, mean, I want to do a specific case first. So, for someone, for example, who has chronic fatigue syndrome and finds exercise difficult because it's too stressful, I imagine this is something that they could do in uh, that would be beneficial in giving giving them essentially some similar benefits without putting them in a situation that is um, taxing them too much. Correct. And there's all kinds of people uh, who have MS, multiple mm. sclerosis. There are some people who have carpal tunnel syndrome, different different um, afflictions, different conditions where for some period of time or for chronic fatigue for long periods of time, they can't do something right? or even if they wanted to. So we put on the bands and this is where the movement movement really dovetails with katsu. We've got so much movement anyway in our body. And with these bands and the pressure on, pressure off, the compression, the, the decompression, that is actually enhancing what the body is doing anyway. Right. And that is leading, especially for people who, you know, we have burn victims. Mm. We have people who have a compound fracture. We have amputees, you know, especially in the military, we've got these, you know, unfortunately, you know, just great tactical athletes. I mean, these, these men can run, they can lift, they can jump, they do all these things. Suddenly they're hit by something and they've lost a leg, they've lost an arm, et cetera. We can still allow their residual limb, their, their stump, if you will, to function, to move, even though they're not holding a barbell, even though they're not doing resistance training. And so that's where Katsu, that's where the Japanese, Dr. Sato and his colleagues saw in the future. And I have to, I didn't explain this in the beginning. When I joined Dr. Sato and his group, Katsu was part of the 22nd century project of Japan. <laughs> that was in, in the year 2000, 2001, the Japanese government asked private industry and the government agencies look forward 100 years in the future what technologies what modalities what what um, uh, protocols do we need to develop now so we can make the japanese population as strong as resilient in the year 2100 somewhere out there yeah yeah well, and so with katsu and they and we, we people visit us from the the different government agencies showed us the demographics of the Japanese population that's the most rapidly aging population in the world. And he said, you know, in 40 years, the population is going to um, go by half. Right. It's going to drop by half. So what, who's going to be left? Who's going to be the workers? Who's going to be the blue collar workers, white collar workers, et cetera. And Katsu was part of that entire equation, again, in this pretty interesting thought process of what do we need to do now? to be as healthy as possible 100 years in the future. Well, because I have to say something like this, the, the thing that human beings are best at is forgetting how stupid we are about predicting the future. So, you know, no one predicted the internet the way it is, let it on at all. No one predicted, I mean, you know, watch any old sci-fi movie and it's pretty funny. But um, I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment, but yeah, yeah. I, I would argue that the thing, the thing that we, uh, the only thing we know is that we have no idea what's going to happen in a hundred years, other than um, most of the things that will be commonly used for whatever 
are completely inconceivable now. I mean, if we just for the fun of it, if we actually crack the code on nuclear fusion, where effectively we have free energy for the rest of our life, you know, that's going to change everything. In fact, the entirety of Star Trek is based on the idea of free energy. Um, that just changes the world. But but I think it's a very cool thought experiment, um, nonetheless. And I, I like the idea of it. Let me let me kind of mm, go this way. For the different kinds of people who may be listening slash watching, whether they're athletes or non-athletes or former athletes or uh, in a wheelchair or, you know, whatever the situation, how does one um, find the appropriate protocol to use and how does that protocol change over time? Yeah. So including like, you know, the bodybuilding thing, if somebody wants that goal versus someone who is just immobile versus whatever's in or an athlete who's looking to deal with the recovery again, how do we pick the, uh, or how do they find the appropriate protocol? And again, how does that evolve with over time? Yeah. So when we, we, the individual buys the cuts of equipment, it comes with actually a too massive amount of information. <laughs> just like a, a huge book. It's uh, 273 pages and it goes through all the different protocols, whether you're a disabled person all the way to, if you're a, a collegiate athlete looking to uh, increase their vertical leap, for example. And we simply give the, the specific protocols to achieve a specific purpose. Now, most people, especially as we age, let's take let's take a 65-year-old who used to be a collegiate athlete or a high school athlete, et cetera. And he, over the last, I don't know, 40 years, starting to leave his sedentary life. Now he retires and he's got a bad back, a bad knee, his shoulder hurts, what can he do? And so what they do is we, we offer a variety of services for those people. Give us a very specific, give us your goals. And we give to you the spe very specific protocols that you can use using the equipment to achieve your specific goals. Some goals, maybe it's, you know, the, the old college uh, athlete who's 65, maybe he was a triple jumper in in college or high school. Maybe he can't touch his toes now. And he simply goes, I want to be able to tie my shoes. Okay, let's let's achieve flexibility. Well, you know what? I can't lift my shoulder and, you know, I've got no bicep. I got a dad bod. Okay, let's start building up your upper body. Let's start building up your lower body. Let's say your own child is now a cross-country runner and you simply want to go out there and start running to support your child's effort. So we we take the person using katsu with, and let's say they have three separate goals. We say, you can't do all at once, but let, what is your number one goal? Let's achieve that. What's your number two goal? Let's achieve that. What's your number three goal? Let's achieve that with very specific protocols that they can follow and that we provide. I'm going to do two things in one fell swoop. I'm going to uh, ask you to be a little more specific if you can. Um, and I'm going to use me as the case study because it's my podcast. I can do whatever I want. So um, so as a 61-year-old sprinter okay. who is um, who basically at this age, I can't recover as fast as I want to get as much training in as I want. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to just do everything I can to stay as strong and fast as I can uh, or slow down, slowing down for as long as I can. Okay. So uh, if that, if those are my goals, to the extent that I've yeah. given them uh, with enough clarity, what happens next? What is that protocol? What might that protocol look like? So we go back and we say, okay, we know your age. We know your goal. Can you be a little more specific? For example, do you participate in master's track events? I am an all-American master's, uh, a master's all-American sprinter. So yes, I do. Okay, so is you uh, are, then we then we get more specific on is your event the hundred two hundred hundred meter outdoor sixty meter indoor. Okay, then we get more specific. Where is your weakness and where are your strengths? Is it the start? Is it the acceleration? Is it no, where is it's it? uh, it's uh, holding on after max velocity? So okay, sprint endurance or speed. Okay, endurance. so it, if you wanted to drop, let's say three tenths of a second getting your start would be a start and then that acceleration phase. I'm saying poo-poo on the start simply because I've trained with a handful of Olympians and I get them for the first two steps out of the blocks. After that, oh, they... you, you're ahead of them. Okay. I got it. it no, I've got, I got a good start. Yeah. Okay. So it's the latter half of the race. Yeah. 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 Okay. Once I hit max velocity, it's holding on to that. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. So in that case, then there's three things you can do. One, before or when you get to the track, use the Katsu device and use the cut cycle. So it's pressure on, pressure off. You can do that while you're stretching or while you're doing your easy jog, et cetera. What we want to do is when you start, let's say your core workout, we want you to be as vascular, as elastic as possible, as possible. The, the moment that you say in your mind, now my workout begins, because most athletes, to be honest, yes, workout will start at 8 a.m., but, you know, I've, I've been around a lot of track athletes, you know, you're, you're, you're joking around, you're, you're not mentally going to be on the track yet you're sort of in the field so you we want you to be as vascular as optimized as possible now in this process we know through our testing that when you take off the bands you have between 12 and 15 minutes when those hormones are maximized so huh. let's say you're working on the last 30 meters of your 60 meter run. What we would like you to do or what we recommend that you do is be using the katsu in the period of your preparation, warm up, your early drills, et cetera. When you get to the portion of your training where it's you're working on that sustained velocity in that second half of the race, roughly 12 to 15 minutes before that, you take off the bands because we view katsu is this is equipment, but the mechanism of your body will continue. So let's say you've done all this prep work and it's now from 8 to 8.30 and you know you're going to be hitting it hard from 8.45 to 9 o'clock. Ideally, you're using the, the katsu until until 8.30-ish. Take off the bands, you know, uh, uh, hydrate, stretch a little more if you want. And then in that in that 15 minute window, you are hormonally optimized in all the measures that we have. That is a great time for you to be working on the things that you want to be working on best. After you've you've pushed yourself, you've finished your workout, you know, you, you're telling off if it's a hot day, throw back on the bands in order to remove as much lactate that is built up as possible, as quickly as possible. So the next day, let's say that was a Monday. So on Tuesday, you can hit it hard again at the age of 61. Interesting. So I have, I, I'm trying to figure out uh, how inappropriate I can be. Um, this is, we're talking about whole body Viagra. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. I mean, the, the, in fact, for people who don't know, for sprinters, it was a very, very well-kept secret for a while. They were using Viagra as a performance-enhancing drug because it's a vasodilator. And uh, in fact, Justin Gatlin got busted for that. There was a guy named um, Val Barnwell who got busted for that. Um, actually, he didn't get busted for that. He got busted for for something else. But um, part of his argument when he was saying that he either A, got didn't do anything, B, someone doped him, C, what do you care what I do with my body, D, are you telling me I can't use Viagra to please my woman? And we're all like, wait, what? You're using, wait, what? So um, uh, that was, and this was like 15 years ago when just the idea of Viagra as a performance enhancing drug, suddenly people are going, oh, um, that's interesting. So that's very, that's really fascinating. You're setting yourself up to with all, with the vasodilation to be well, part of, I mean, I'm getting way too biochemical in my head. I'm just thinking about, um, ATP production uh, in addition to like, clearing lactate and having just those sort of wide open capillaries, which is the same thing caffeine does as well. Uh, this, that's really interesting. Yeah. In addition, let's say, uh, actually, just you mentioned Dustin Gatlin. He came to us, and he's a cuts user. All of the the track. The, or well, I well, well, let me well, let me let me interrupt and say this about not just about Justin, yeah. but it, it does include Justin. Um, every uh, so, I'm a former nationally ranked athlete, and I guess I am now too, but uh, but not in a way that matters in my life. I, there's no you know prize money as a Masters All American sprinter, but. What I know from the Olympian, Olympic level people that I know is uh, they will do and try anything and everything just to get that little bit of an edge. And I know that a handful of things that Justin uses don't actually do anything. I'm not saying you're in that situation. Okay. I'm just saying that it's very interesting watching 
people at that level is like if they think it's going to do something it's going to, then they're going to try it um yeah. but i'm so again not trying to be dismissive but it, but i know i'm really what i'm really thinking of is some of the companies that use justin as their example and i know for a fact that product does absolutely nothing um yeah. including my saying when they first showed it to me and you know we're touting justin it's like yeah that's cool he just lost the last couple of races so yeah. you might you know want so, to- so i just mentioned justin because you mentioned him but True. his the team and the group of people that he worked with this is what he came to us so we're at we're, I'm, I'm giving you a very specific example yeah 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 justin came and he said my arms my arm speed is not as good as my leg strength he's he's a leg driven athlete in addition his and i i could get this mixed up so i forgive me on this either his right leg or his left leg is stronger than the other Mm-hmm. And as a runner, if your arm speed and both legs are not totally in sync, you're only running it at the fat at at the slower speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so with Justin and with many other athletes, what we do is we put a higher pressure on the weaker leg or the weaker arm. And so in his practice, we're essentially putting more metabolic stress on the weaker limb. Yep. Then the stronger limb. And because we know if we, if let's say theoretically, this leg was running at a 9.6 and this leg is running at a 9.8, well, our effective speed will only be 9.8. Right. So we want to increase the speed of the weaker leg. So at least now this weaker leg is running, let's say at a 9.7 or 9.6. Therefore, you're going to be able to achieve the optimal speed of your faster leg and same with the arm. So in his case and, and many other runners and especially jumpers, you know, jumpers or triple jumpers, uh, they're they're on one leg, pole vaulters, you name it, uh, javelin throwers, you name it. And so what we do is with, with the katsu, we can put different pressures on different limbs at the same time. So it it's a, and and that in itself you're making the athlete more balanced and you know let's say you're a hurdler well you know you're pushing off I, I forgot what the the technical you know pushing off one one yeah. leg and, and extending the leg out so we're putting different pressures on the athlete as they're going through their technical movements and in the swimming world where I come from, you know, Michael Phelps, you know, he's got this perfect stroke left and right arm are just spot on people who get silver and bronze and don't beat Michael Phelps. They literally are off just a tad, just a tad bit. And so what we do with them is we put a a higher pressure on their weaker side. So you get the same propulsion on both sides. And we do that with track and field. We do that with basketball players who who are strong going up with their right and not so strong on their left or when they spin to their left or you spin to right. As they go through their technical movements, we are putting different pressures, therefore different stresses in the practice So when they are on the field of play or they're in competition, their uniformity, their, their, you know, left and right side, up and uh, lower body, upper body core are all optimized to whatever the, the, you know, level that you want to achieve. Very interesting. Are there any questions that I haven't asked or even better, any question that I haven't asked where you would tell me no, because I kept asking you questions like, oh, yeah, we do that. Oh, yeah, it's that. So um, so I'm trying I, to think of, I can't think of a question that would be, that would stump the band. Um, I, I think there's one, Katsu was the subject of a keynote speech at the World Congress of Sports Medicine last year. And it oh, was wow. a, a speech done by the IOC sports scientists under Professor uh, Giannis Pizzolatus. He didn't show us his uh, results of his research on Katsu until we got to the World Congress of Sports Medicine. He goes, Steve, don't worry. You're going to be very happy, but I don't want to tell you. I want it to be a surprise. I was a little nervous, frankly. Here, all these sports scientists come from around the world, and they're in this giant lecture hall and professors up there explaining the benefits of this cut cycle, pressure on, pressure off. Yeah. First one made sense, second one made sense, and the last one just absolutely floored me. I hadn't thought of that, but when he explained what was happening, it was 
Yes. Why didn't I think of it? And that is the cognitive awareness of athletes. And Professor Pitzlatus, who works with, you know, the IOC, so he's working with all these great athletes. He says, you know, the greatest athletes are so cognitively aware of everything around them, their tactile feel, their spatial awareness. They're just, they're just locked in like, you know, like we know, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, LeBron James, Larry Bird, you name it. They just, they just have this spatial awareness, this kinetic feel, this, this technical, you know, the, the touch. And he says, if body physiologically understand understandably with katsu but what, what his research showed them is after you do the pressure on pressure off pressure on pressure off he as a scientist said you know if we're increasing the elasticity of the vascular tissue in the shoulders in the core where the bands are not he goes then it must make sense that they're increasing the capillary actions in the brain that's mm. what he thought mm. he said so he tested these athletes would do the, the, the cot cycle on and off. Then he tested them with a control group and experimental group, their cognitive awareness through basic uh, cognitive tests and the pressure on pressure people just scored higher. Interesting. And I go, that is great. Cause as the IOC person, that is what he's, you know, he's, he's looking at things that optimize human performance. Right. You know, the physical part is a given that emotional, you know, do, do you choke under pressure? Do you rise to the occasion of pressure? Another aspect. And yeah. then the third was this cognitive awareness that completely blew me away. That's very interesting. I, yeah, I don't even have a frame of reference where I can explain that one per se. But of course, the joke that comes up is, yeah, that lack of spatial awareness is the entire reason I'm not a professional basketball player. The fact that I'm a five foot five white guy has nothing to do with it. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, Stephen, this has been a, a total, total blast. I can only assume that there are people who want to find out more. So can you tell them how they can do that? Yeah, just, just go to www.katsu.com. Um, we offer webinars, uh, free webinars. You can join, you can ask any questions whatsoever. We sell through you know, our, our online, you know, katsu.com. Um, a lot of people first come across katsu through, you know, people like yourself who who interview me or maybe they heard from their next door neighbor or something. Everybody, it, it's a non-intuitive way to get stronger, faster, be more cognitively aware. So it does require some explanation. Yeah. And I spend 90% of my time explaining katsu. <laughs> so um, that's how we've grown. So awesome. www.katsu.com. A-A-A-T-S-U. Yes. So, yes, some people can't see your hand. Oh, sorry. There we go. Well, not that they can't see it. You need to get closer. They're just listening, not watching. Ah, uh, got it. Got it. Got yeah. You, got you don't it. Need, that's sort of like going to a foreign country and speaking English louder to make people hear it. <laughs> so understand it. It just doesn't yeah. work. So, um, so once again, thank you. Thank you. Um, and for everyone else, you know, A, please go check out Katsu and tell me what you think. And especially if you decide to try it, I'm dying to hear what you experience because that'll be super, super fun. Um, and let's take it from there. And just as a reminder, go, go back over to www.jointhe movementmovement.com to find all the previous episodes, all the ways you can engage with us, all the places you can leave a review and a thumbs up and hit the bell icon and subscribe and blah, blah, blah. And if you have any requests or suggestions, if you or any feedback, if you have some idea of someone who should be on the show that I haven't talked to, especially if you know someone who thinks I have a case of cranial rectal reorientation syndrome, um, then, you know, I'm all ears, even if they're up my butt from that metaphor. Uh, but suffice it to say, you can drop me an email, just send an email to move. M-O-V-E at join the movement movement.com. And until next time, go out, have fun and live life feet first. <laughs>